Hey guys, uh, my name is Jason, if you're new to my channel. So uh, this is going to be another video on Christianity. The title will be, Are We All Children of God? I'll talk a little bit about my spiritual path before I get started. I've always, into it, like my intuition, I always believed that there was a God. Um, I wasn't raised in a Christian family. Uh, my mom was, I would consider, uh, more like spiritual um she was you know she did the tarot card stuff she you know liked a lot of the eastern uh philosophies buddhism and stuff like that uh and i kind of followed that that path also um more like when i was in my 20s i, I really started like searching and i had like you know looked into christianity a little bit but the whole Trinity thing that really um, was confusing to me, and uh, it seemed uh, it seemed blas like blasphemous. It, I wasn't comfortable, um, you know, with this Jesus thing. And if you if you want to uh, hear like a good explanation of the Trinity, go look at my previous video. I I think that it's uh, quite uh, well explained, and I'm doing a very very long video about. Um, the Jewish Trinity, actually. So it's basically justifying and explaining the foundation of the Trinity that is actually found in the Old Testament. It was only when I uh, watched Michael Heiser, uh, and you can check him out, uh, Michael Heiser, the Jewish Trinity, that I really was able to understand the Trinity uh, in a correct fashion. I mean, most Christians don't really explain it well and just going up and saying uh well we believe jesus is god uh, especially to a non-believer uh is, is not the correct approach it's a lot more complicated than that and uh, that's what i was told and i don't think that the christians maybe they had a lot of faith but i don't think they really read their bible uh, enough or they didn't read the old testament enough it's important to understand that uh, you know, all of the New Testament is uh, founded in the Old Testament with uh, now that like I've really dived deep into the Old Testament and New Testament, I realized that there's no real new claims that are being made in the New Testament. In fact, everything is kind of somewhat concealed, but there's foreshadowing of the Trinity. So, you know, I, I heard, you know, I believed it that, oh, this is like pagan, uh, paganism that infiltrated in the doctrine. And it was a uh, Constantine, just give me a, I have a sore throat. So, yeah, uh, I've only been a Christian for three years and I'm 43. So I came to Christianity when I was 40. Like I said, I always believed in God. Uh, I just didn't know where, you know, who, who he was, what God was. And I, I, I mean, I looked, I looked into every single possible thing and I never really, uh, was attracted to Christianity. First thing I, I, I thought it was very, very arrogant to say that, um, Christianity is the only real religion, um, that, that that the only way that you you can be saved is through jesus it's it's a very in a way arrogant claim and that's the way i saw it so to be honest i'm actually very nervous um with what i'm going to share to you because i know that many people will think that well it's arrogant uh so i'm going to start this powerpoint presentation and the title of the presentation is, Are We All Children of God? Now, before we get started, we see that uh, in Judeo-Christian uh, beliefs, you got the Garden of Eden. So uh, God created uh, his family first uh, with the angels. So uh, they're referred also as sons of God. Um, and then after he wanted a earthly family and he created man in his image. So we are all, all humans are, are image bearers. We are, are made in the image of God, but we're also fallen. 
we're fallen uh fallen creation you know all creation has fallen because of the, the sin that happened when the, the serpent uh, deceived adam and eve uh so i'm just going to look and i'm going to show you at least from a christian perspective what it means to be uh, children of god like are we all children of god um so let's see what the bible says I'm going to share the screen. Slide show. From beginning. I'm going to try and make this bigger because somebody said that they were watching. Um, they were watching my last uh, video. And it was really interesting, but they couldn't see see me uh, very much. It was like a little square, so it's kind of less interesting. So what I did is the majority of uh, the slides, I kind of pushed them to the left, except for this one. So the presentation that I'm going to make is uh, looking at the what the Bible says about uh, children of uh, children of God. All right, this is the only one that I'm going to have to move uh, my face out here. All right. So in the Bible, there are son, sons, and only begotten son of God. So the angels are referred to as sons of God. You see that in Genesis 6, where it says the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for them, whoever, whoever they chose. Um, this here in Genesis 6, 2 is actually... Um, it says, sons of God, these are fallen angels. These are angels that left um, their, their abode in heaven and descended and uh, mated with uh, women. If you're interested in, in that weird passage right there, you can go see my previous uh, video that uh, the video is titled, um, why, why God Really Flooded the Earth. It's uh, my last one that I did is, uh, I think, an amazing explanation that does the Trinity justice. I wish that somebody would have explained it the way I explained it in the video. Um, so, yeah, so you have son, sons, and only begotten sons. There's also in, I think, uh, Job, at one point, there's the divine council. And in the divine council, there's the heavenly hosts that are there. And uh, there's a Satan um, Satan isn't really a name. It's actually a, a title. It's, it's like the prosecutor, the adversary, or the accuser. Some of them translate it as the Satan. And in the divine council, uh, God is having a discussion about Job. And he's saying what a great servant Job is. Uh, and Satan says, yeah, well, you know what? You've blessed him. And if you start taking away stuff, and you start uh, removing the blessings, he's going to turn around and curse you. Well, in the end, Job uh, doesn't curse uh, God. And well, that that's a good lesson for us to know, is that I, I know many people that, that are Christians, and when either the sin of other people, because we all have free will, God allows everybody in this earth to, to have free will, and because uh, we are fallen, because we have a sin nature, uh, we do bad things. And we especially do bad things to each other. And that, uh, that happens with, you know, our loved ones. So I know, uh, and I see this often in the hospital, because I work in the hospital and ICU. And, you know, family members, you know, uh, there's tragedies and they're in intensive care. And, and sometimes these people die. And I've noticed that a lot of Christians lose their faith. And sometimes I like, I wonder, well, God, you know, our faith is supposed to be there so that no matter what tragedy and hardship we experience in this life, we have a strong foundation in Christ. Uh, it's kind of like the analogy of building, uh, you know, building a building a house uh, on the sand and that foundation is is not not solid and when the when the water comes the tide comes in it just washes uh basically the the house away so you want to 
build your life on a firm foundation, and that's faith in God, more specifically faith, faith in Christ. So yeah, I see a lot of people that blame God for what sinful people do. Now, God is working out salvation. We have uh, Paradise Lost, uh, when Eden, uh, when Adam and Eve are cast out of um, the garden. But as you see um, in, in Revelation, you have uh, Eden restored. You know, so God is working things out. And we shouldn't judge in the middle of the movie. Let's wait till the end of the movie before we make uh, our final uh, judgments. Um, but, you know, the book of Job really... Um, it is an important book because it's basically saying, you know what, like, you're not, you're, how would I put this? Well, don't curse God where, when he sends challenges or, you know, your faith is supposed to give you a firm foundation so that no matter what in this world happens, you won't be destroyed. And I, I often see people walk away from the faith when other people that are dealing with their own sins do horrible things. And then they, they curse God and they lose faith. Anyways, so angels are referred to as sons of God. That's what I was saying when uh, the angels are in the divine council and um, Satan is uh, challenging God and saying, yeah, yeah, you know what? You're blessing him. That's why he likes you. You take away the blessings. You give him hardship and you remove, uh, you know, everything and, and, and throw tragedy on him. And, and you know, he, he'll curse you uh, in that um, in that passage. It says sons of God there also. And, and that's that's the divine counsel with the angels. So in the Bible because we're looking at the question, are we all children of God? You have uh, sons of God, angels. He also refers sometimes to the whole um, nation of Israel as my son. So Israel is, uh, is referred also as a son of God. In Jeremiah 31, 20, it says, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he a delightful child? Indeed, as often as I have spoken against him, I certainly still remember him. And then after there's believers as sons of God, all right, uh, Romans 8, 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. There's also uh, some of the kings like King David in Psalms 89, 27. Uh, also, I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. So here we see a uh, son, uh, we see angels, we uh, see Israel sometimes referred to, we see uh, the king uh, of um, the nation of Israel also being referred to that. And then finally, we see uh, believers um, in Christ Jesus uh, that are sons of God. Then we have obviously the only begotten son, which is Christ Jesus. So uh, when you're looking at begotten, a lot of people say like, oh, look, uh, the only begotten son. That means that uh, if uh, God begot him, he's begotten. That means he was created. So he's not eternal. He's not the eternal son. But uh, if we look here, it says, uh, does only begotten mean Jesus was created? So the Greek term is monogeneus. And that actually means the one and only, or the one of a kind, or the unique. And the act of begetting doesn't necessarily mean that something is created or born. It can also mean brought forth. Now, in my uh, video on uh, the Trinity explained, I explain it uh, pretty much. Um, I'll try and do like a quick uh, version of it. Um, you're listening to me speak when I'm interacting with other individuals, okay, you'll never know my whole being, my whole essence, every thought I've had, you won't know me in my totality ever, and I won't know you in, in your totality also ever, but 
we we do reach out to each other we do form relationships with each other uh, through our words and our words often reveal our heart right so when you look at the father who is the ancient of days the invisible yahweh the consuming fire um the yahweh that that we can't go into Yahweh's presence. Uh, we, we would immediately die. And we see that in, in the Old Testament, right? So we have this, uh, this creator that wants a family, okay? He wants a relationship. But man, the whole family of man has fallen and needs to be redeemed. We need a savior. God has to fix it. And this is what happens. He does fix it in the end. We do return to Eden. We do see the ancient of days face to faith, uh, faith, faced, face to face. Uh, and we do that by actually being clothed with, with Christ. So we have to, uh, we have to put on Christ to uh, then go in to the father's uh, presence. Um, also, uh, when we speak, it also, shows our thoughts right so through the words we reveal what set what mindset we're in and where the state of our heart is and that's why they talk about the trinity and they say that uh the word is god and the spirit is god and uh, the father is god that's because the yahweh emanates towards creation his word revealing his heart and his Holy Spirit revealing its mind. And through God's word and the spirit, which can enter us because we're like temples of God, then we get to know God. That's how he communicates with us. Now, in the Old Testament, um, the you know wisdom, if you look at the book of uh, the wisdom of Solomon, the Sirach, and also in Proverbs, we see that wisdom is a co-creator, that uh, God uses wisdom as an agent to create. So everything is created through uh, wisdom, which is actually also the word. So that's when um, when it says that uh, in, the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And uh, then the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Okay, so. The eternal son is of the same essence as the father, but the eternal son is always doing the will of the father. And when the word came uh, became flesh and dwelt among us in the man Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, was on him. So now you have uh, the presence of God in bodily form. Uh, it's the word and the spirit. So you can, you can just think of the mind and the heart. God is able to reveal that. Now he's so much more than that, but that's as close as we can get to God and we can know him. Look, I'm talking to you now, right? Uh, and you're going to judge me. Okay. Like you're going to be like, Jason's like this or Jason's like that. You're, you're basically making a, a, a judgment on my being by my words. And, and my words express what I think. And that's why the Holy Spirit, they call it the spirit of truth and understanding. And when you... Um, so if you don't have the, the spirit of truth and understanding then you don't understand the mind of God and you won't understand his word. In fact, it says that the spirit of God testifies. It's a witness. It's a, if you look at all of the Holy Spirit texts, the majority of it is all cerebral. It will teach us. It will remind us. Um, it gives us truth. It gives us understanding. And that's why it says that you have to um, believe in the, the son believe in the word made flesh and when you have faith in the word then the holy spirit comes and dwells in you and then deep inside your your being as real as the wood here then you know 
whether Jesus is the son of God, then you know whether the claims in the New Testament are real or are not. Okay. Um, so I'm going to bring this down here. So the only begotten son isn't something that is created. Uh, it is uh, begotten because it is brought forth out or brought forth from the bosom of the father. It, uh, it was not created, but it is able to be brought forth and to accomplish um, what God wants, wants him to do. And Jesus talks about that, not my will, but my father's will. In the Old Testament, there's a, a cool verse where uh, I think it's in Isaiah. And uh, it says, um, um, the word will come out of my mouth and accomplish everything that I set out for it to do, and it will not return void. So it seems that uh, we know that uh, the ancient of days, Yahweh sitting on the throne is a spirit. He doesn't have a physical body. So when he says comes out of my mouth, it's just using uh, physical terms to explain spiritual terms, you know, because we don't really have words for spiritual terms. So we kind of like use analogies and stuff like that. So when he says my word will come out of my mouth, it just means that, um, you know, it's the word is emanating and, and brought forth out. And it does uh, something. I mean, the Old Testament saying, so this word coming out of his mouth, it's going to accomplish something. And it's not going to return void. And that's kind of like the gospel. That, that is what the word did. The word was brought forth from the bosom of the father, incarnated in a body prepared for it, and became a sacrifice to correct uh, sin. So uh, Genesis twenty two twelve. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God. Because you have not withheld from me your only son. Uh, so this is um, God speaking to Abraham. And he's speaking about Isaac. Uh, this was when uh, God asked uh, Abraham to sacrifice his son. And then he said, no, don't hurt the boy. I'll provide a sacrifice. Um, he says, your only son. Well, that doesn't make sense because... Abraham had Ishmael first. In fact, Ishmael was the firstborn and Isaac was born after. But Ishmael came from Abraham um, basically having sex with uh, one of his servants uh, because they were both very old. And God told Abraham, well, uh, I, I will give you a son. And, and from this son will be the lineage towards the Messiah. And, um, uh, I guess they didn't really believe it. And his, Sarah, his wife said, well, you need a descendant. I'm too old. I can't have a baby. So, uh, you know, she basically told him, look, just go and make a baby. And this one's an Ishmael. So Ishmael, even though Ishmael is the firstborn, he's not the son of the promise. So again, when you hear your only son or only begotten, this uh, is basically the unique the one of uh, the the chosen one, um, you know, that's pretty much it. So you can see, uh, I hope I convince you that only begotten is not that Christ at one point didn't exist. The eternal son has always been with the father. If the, um, if the word is wisdom, well, God always had, uh, had a voice. He always uh, had wisdom. And the Holy Spirit, if it's the spirit of truth and understanding, then God always had truth and understanding. So that's why you see that this Trinity is um, eternal. There is the eternal son. And I mentioned in the Trinity uh, uh, video, the last one, I hope you guys watch it. Uh, when I when I talked about um, the uh, the eternal uh, son, the it says that God is love. It doesn't say that God is loving. It says God is love. And if you're just Yahweh, just one being alone there, then you can't really be love because love has to do with other people. It's an act of giving towards another. So that's why God in uh, the Christian um, 
religion is love. And we can say that God is love because God has been continually in a relationship with the Trinity. And he wanted to extend that family. And he had a heavenly family called the sons of God, the angels. And then after he wanted to create on earth, sons of God too. So uh, in 1 Timothy 2, it says, God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. So Romans 3.10 says, as it, uh, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. But the problem is in the spiritual world, there's no physicality. So what happens is the more similar you are to something in a spiritual world, the closer you are. And when you are exactly the same, then you are one with that thing. That's why the Son and the Holy Spirit are God, because the Spirit is God's mind and the word is god's heart and you'll see in the new testament often it's like they talk about the holy spirit but then after they'll say uh, that we have the spirit of christ who cries out abba father and then you're like okay well there's the holy spirit but now you're just switching and saying uh, that we have the spirit of jesus but i, I thought jesus was the word uh, now he's the holy spirit and so it, it becomes all kind of you know mashed up but think of it this way, okay, if my being, okay, I have a heart and a mind, well, what I fill my mind with will affect my heart, okay, and what's in my heart, the state of my heart will affect my mind, so that's why it's almost interchangeable, you know, you got, you got the Father, you got the Son, and you got the Holy Spirit, it, it's, it's all together, you know, because the mind and the heart work in tandem to express the being uh, that you are and so that other people can know you. But the problem is with sin, when sin entered, see, we have we have um, we have a low. We have a low expectation of of God's perfectness kind of thing you know a little swear here a little lie there that's ah, not that bad and and stuff like that but we have a perfect god god is perfect and the slightest stain in the spiritual world just that tiny stain compared to uh the ancient of days puts you as far as east is to west and this is what happened there is a divide now and we think that we're pretty good people, you know, we do good things and once in a while we screw up, but, you know, from human standards, you know, our, our definition of what is good is deeply flawed and we can't be in God's presence because of our sin, because of our fallen nature. Now think of it this way, when you're, uh, when you're compatible with somebody, you know, we often say like, oh, I'm really close with that person. We're not talking about distance here, right? I'm not talking about I'm really close with that guy. I mean, uh, I'm right at his door. No, you're talking about similarity of qualities. So we, 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 we express inner things ourselves, inner emotions and, and, and love will say, oh, I'm really close with that person. And that's that when we usually say that, it means that we have similar uh, interests, we have maybe similar political views, we have similar similar uh, thought, like we're very similar. And it's very comfortable to be with people that are like-minded. And it's quite a challenge when you have somebody that is completely opposite. Let's say, um, you know, uh, you don't like swearing and you have somebody that's really foul language or something around you, it's uncomfortable and, you know, and stuff like that. So think of it that way. That's how far we are from God. And he is a merciful and graceful God because he's found a free gift to give us because he knows that we're, we're unable to change ourselves. It's like, it's like we have cancer, you know what I mean? And we need a treatment and, 
the cancer will kill us if we don't get uh, uh, the treatment. And God knows that we are fallen and that no matter how hard we try, we'll, we'll never be righteous. We'll, you know, and a lot of, a lot of religions are faith, um, are um, act based, meaning you earn your way to heaven through good deeds. Um, we see that uh, now with modern Judaism, uh, mitzvot. Uh, we see this with Islam. Islam, you know, there's no like, they're actually never sure uh, if they're going to make it to paradise or not. The doctrine really isn't clear about that. So they uh, consider good acts being a way to get to heaven. Now, I'm not putting down uh, good deeds and good actions, but they will not save you. If you are a person that committed a murder and after that you changed your ways and you were, you were an uh, upstanding citizen, when the judge finds out that you're a murderer, you'll go before the judge and the judge will say you're guilty of murder. And you'll say, yeah, but I'm a good person. I've given to charity, you know, and all of these things. And he'll say, well, that's really good. Uh, you know, it's good that you did that, but I'm convicting you not for the good things you've done. I'm convicting you for the murder. So if we've sinned against a holy God, it doesn't matter how many good acts we do. We're getting penalized. We're getting judged for the bad things we've done. And um, so that's kind of the, you know, the, the difference between Christianity and other um, work based, based faiths. Now there's one thing. If you truly have faith, in the gospel and you are um you are reborn and you have the holy spirit well what's going to happen is the natural consequence of being saved and receiving the holy spirit is that you will bear good fruits so of course you will be doing good deeds but the good deeds are not what save you okay christ saves you and it's the holy spirit the spirit of him the spirit of the Father, Holy Spirit, God, the Spirit of God in you that causes you to have, um, it's like the good acts are a symptom of the Holy Spirit, all right? So if you say that you have faith, but you're not bearing any good fruit, maybe you should relook and see if you've actually been honest with your faith and you're not deluding yourself. So uh, Hebrews eleven seven. So by faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So we see here that even in the Old Testament, um, the uh, patriarchs and the the patriarchs are considered righteous because they have faith in the promise now jesus in the old testament hadn't appeared yet so what saves these people is having faith in the promises so um we see that also for abraham um in galatians even as abraham believed god and it was accounted to him for righteousness so though we are unrighteous we've done many unrighteous things but when we have faith, it is considered, God says, he sees it as righteousness, okay? Um, so the thing is now is that once the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, once Christ came, died, resurrected, the whole gospel issue, um, now we still are saved by faith. But those who don't believe in Jesus um, and perhaps those who believe in the law, the Mosaic covenant, well, now they, they don't have faith because now the actual true savior of the world is revealed. So it's all about faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. All right? So again, it's still faith. All right? 
um, we we just have to have faith in uh, the sun. Now, if you truly have faith and people say, often say like, oh, uh, faith, they, they call it blind faith. You know, faith is just another word for trust. A lot of people have faith in themselves, right? What's that mean? That they have blind faith in? No, they have trust. And um, that's just another word. And yeah. So Romans 3, uh, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Okay. There is a huge divide because of sin. We cannot approach God. We need one who is sinless. And that's why the whole Christian uh, terminology of being clothed with Christ, putting on Christ. So even though we're fallen, okay, Christ uh, died, he was righteous, and we are able to put on Christ. And the reason that the only way to fix this uh, separation from God has to be through Jesus, the word made flesh, is because when God first created, he used wisdom, the word, as an agent for creation. So all of the initial creation was uh, brought forth through the eternal son, the word of God wisdom okay so if if wisdom uh you know was a co-creator and now creation is fallen and broken it's just normal that the word should go forth out of the father again to accomplish what the father has set the set the word out to do and it's a guarantee that this will be successful the word the eternal son will not come back to the father void. And that's why we see that Jesus is the uh, lamb of God. So he's the lamb of God. He's the sacrifice for our sins. And in the old Testament, they sacrificed, um, you know, um, lamb, an unblemished lamb, and they would sacrifice it. And that would uh, be a ritual to represent uh, the atoning sacrifice. So they pay for the sins of the people. And this was done over and over. Uh, it didn't really remove sin, but the Savior hadn't come. So if people uh, listened with faith and followed the Mosaic law, they were they were uh, righteous in, God, in God's eyes. But um, Jesus uh, didn't spill the blood of a lamb. Jesus being the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world spilled his blood and had his body broken. And he approached when he ascended after his resurrection, he spent for a certain amount of time um, with the apostles, with uh, his new resurrected body. But eventually, you know, he said, I have to go away. Uh, and when he says that he went up back up to heaven um, and he presented his body. The, the eternal son presented his body to his father and accomplished what the father had set him out to do, basically, right? Um, let's go to the next thing. So salvation is found in no one else, for there is no name Jesus under, the, under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And Jesus actually, I mean, in the Old Testament, all, the, all the, the names in there, they all have a meaning. And the reason his name is Jesus is that it actually means God saves. Um, it's actually Yeshua. It's probably more accurate. Um, just like it's not Jehovah, it's Yahweh. The, um, the J is pronounced like Y. Acts 2.38, Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus said, look, um, if you notice in the gospel, the whole time Jesus is walking with the apostles there, they're, they're clueless. They're so confused. They're making full of mistakes. He keeps on like going like, oh, what am I going to do with these guys? Uh, that's because they had an earthly spirit. Uh, but they, you know, they had Jesus beside them. He was teaching. But when he left and went up to heaven and now sat at the right hand of God, um, he said, like, I have to go because I will send you the Holy Spirit that will dwell in you. And this is a um, this is something he gives right now to all believers. 
And the Holy Spirit is what testifies. It convicts us of sin. Um, and when we start doing these worldly, earthly, uh, lustful f- flesh desires, we start feeling horrible about it. The stuff I used to get pleasure, you know, I lived a hedonistic life. I partied my butt off and uh, I, I had a, a worldly spirit and I enjoyed it. Um, and I was a nice guy. You know, I wasn't a monster. I'm not saying people that don't have the Holy Spirit aren't a monster. But um, in the Old Testament, Jesus, uh, with the first, co- um, no, God in the first covenant, he made these uh, laws written on a stone. But he says that he will make a second covenant, which is the second covenant that Jesus made, the New Testament. That's why we call it the new covenant. He says, I will write my laws on their uh, mind and their heart. So it's a circumcision of the heart. It's the removal of uh, the flesh from the heart, the fleshly desires, and it's a renewal of the mind. So this second covenant, okay, is not just a written law. He actually, through the Holy Spirit, renews our mind and um, and gives us a new heart. That's the new covenant. Okay. Uh, 1 John 8, 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is a gift. Okay. It, you don't have to try and and suppress yourself and, and you know and 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 earn your way to heaven god's like you can't do it he goes you know something horrible happened in uh in uh, eden and you know satan who was supposed to be a servant uh to you know with along with the other angels uh you know really betrayed us and and now we're born with this fallen nature and he knows that we can't discipline ourselves to salvation um so he knows that that he has to do something and that's what i just said before the word you know was was the agent of creation and now god needs to make a new creation he needs to make a new heaven new earth he needs to restore eden and he has to uh give us uh a new nature And in the New Testament, they talk about uh, Christ uh, as the second Adam, okay? You had Adam here, you know, uh, and he failed, but now we have a second Adam. And because Adam failed, notice that we're like blueprints of the fallen nature. Like we don't don't have to try uh, and go to school to be bad. It's just our default setting. And through Christ... He, he, we will become copies of the uh, eternal son. That's why in Christianity, he talks about adoption, that we will be adopted into God's family and we will be like him, like the ancient of days, like Yahweh sitting on the throne. No, like the eternal son. John 3, 16, 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes uh, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Notice over here, it says uh, that whoever doesn't believe, um, That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now, if you've seen any of my videos on rethinking hell, I um, believe in the doctrine of conditional immortality. I don't believe that, um, I believe only God has more immortality. I don't even think the angels have immortality because in the, um, in uh, the Bible and in some of my older uh, videos on uh, there's like part four, one to four on rethinking hell. It even uh, has passages that uh, God says in the divine council. Uh, I tell you that ye, ye are gods, but ye shall die like men. And when they say God, it's God with a little G. And when you look at it, actually the word Elohim is, appears there. A lot of people think that's the name of God, but it's actually a designation. It just means somebody whose abode is in the spiritual world. So they they do refer 
to uh, Yahweh, uh, the eternal father, the ancient of days as Elohim, um, because his abode is thrown uh, is in the heavenly realms. But uh, Elohim actually is just a designation. So uh, the sons of God are also Elohim. Um, so um, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. So uh, the doctrine of conditional immortality says that um, God gives us this life. He gives us free will. We can reject him. We can do whatever we want. Uh, he allows us this life and it's a gift. It's a gift to the wicked and a, it's a gift to, to, to the righteous, you know, but when we die here, we there will be a resurrection and there will be a judgment. And there is the eternal life. There's the next life. And that life is only for those who accept the gift of salvation through Christ. So, um, the ones that do not, just like I said before, they'll appear before God. They'll, they'll say all the good things that they did, and he'll point out all the horrible things that you've done. And he'll say, you're condemned not for the good things you've done, but for the violations that you've done towards me, towards uh, other people. So like, we're guilty. We're really not in a good position here. And it's going to be even more painful when you realize that you really didn't have to earn anything on this earth. All you had to do was accept the free gift, you know, to realize that you're going to miss out on eternal life. Uh, go see uh, my videos on rethinking hell because the penalty of sin is death, not this eternal conscious torment thing that you hear most mainstream Christianity speak about. No, we, it talks about the wicked, uh, being destroyed, the destruction of the wicked, um, the uh, they will perish. These are all words that mean death. In fact, the second death is, is in Revelation when it says that uh, Hades and uh, all of the people that didn't accept uh, the gift of salvation, they will be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. And the, often the metaphors are like throwing um, weeds into the fire. They just burn up. So I do not believe that people that reject salvation through Christ will burn eternally. Nor do I think that any Christian is more holier than any other non-believing or any person that doesn't, that believes in another um, religion. Um no, like uh, Christians actually, um, they are convicted of their sin. They painfully realize how sinful they are, even when they continue, especially when you have the Holy Spirit um, that is convicting you, you uh, keenly are aware of every thought, every desire. Uh, it like puts a laser beam on your fallen nature and it makes it really uncomfortable and then it makes you want to change don't forget that with christianity people often think that it's like well you want to be a christian you got to follow these rules okay no what god promises is that he'll put his uh, law in your mind and on your heart so that through the holy spirit he gradually transforms you truly transform you so that you're not suppressing your bad habits and repressing and, and struggling with it. It's that over time, especially if you dive deep and you feed the Holy Spirit with the word of God and prayer, and you surround yourself with other believers, because Jesus says, where uh, two or more of you are there, there I am. So when more than one believer with the Holy Spirit arise, it's like little flames coming together to make a blazing uh, fire. Um, and, you know, to, so that's what I'm saying. It's like, um, I find that 
before I was a Christian, Christians just looked really boring. And it was like, well, great. Now I'm an adult. I'm going to put all these rules and, and suppress myself. But in reality, it's not that. It's that I it's changing my thoughts and my de desires. There's actually a true transformation occurring. Uh, I wish it was faster than it is going now. But every year I look back and slowly but surely, uh, God, God is breaking me down in certain ways. And, and then when I look back, I'm like, wow, that really horrible time that I went through in my life. Um, I learned a lot and I'm different. I'm better and I'm stronger. So a lot of people, especially nowadays, uh, they run away from suffering, but suffering, um, as a Christian is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I don't think any Christian wishes that they suffer, but they don't see suffering as uh, a punishment ever. See, what brings more glory to God? Somebody who has a good life, no challenges, that's really smiling and happy and says, yeah, I'm Christian, I love Jesus and stuff like that. Or somebody who um, is riddled with uh, financial problems, health problems, um, full of injustices are happening to that person. And they have a smile on their face and they, they seem pretty calm and they're still nice to people. And people uh, look at, look at the person and say like, Oh my, like, like, I, how are you doing this? Like, like how, like I'd be going crazy if all this happens. And then you share your faith, you know, that it brings more glory to God to have a Christian who still loves God with all his heart and has everything in this, in this world removed. And it seems like a lot of Christians end up getting that. So this world is constantly running uh, away from suffering, even to the point of demanding, like, you got to affirm this, you got to affirm that, you're hurting my feelings. Oh, this is making me feel so, feel bad inside. It's like, remove suffering. No, man. I was a stubborn, stubborn person, man. I, and and, and I, I always believed in God. And I was talking and I was praying to God and, you know, he said, you know what, I'll help you. He leveled me. He leveled me many, many times uh, until I decided to come to and work with him, you know, <laughs> instead, instead of uh, being like whipped like a stubborn donkey and stuff like that. I think that the most darkest times in my life, the most humiliating, the most demeaning the most the darkest times in my life is when i evolved the most really truly um so suffering not always the worst thing uh first john 2 23 no one who know uh, no one who denies the son has the father and whoever acknowledges the son has the father also and that that's the thing you know when i i was praying to God. And I, I was like really desperate because I had tried every other spiritual path. I mean, I had tried Eckhart Tolle. I had tried Krishnamurti, Yogananda, um, the Kabbalah. I mean, everything, I, everything and anything, but the gospel. And um, it just was not working. And in fact, a lot of the stuff, um, it just stuck in my head and it puffed me up because like, I was able to, to, to say wise things, but I never even followed it. And it was actually trying to just sound wise most of the time. So even, you know, these, because like, I can't say like, oh yeah, only Christianity is, uh, you know, has wisdom. Everything else is just like garbage. No, there, there's truth in a lot of uh, uh, different uh, spiritual uh, teachings and stuff like that. But um, it didn't humble me especially when your spiritual path has to do with your effort. Because if you're becoming enlightened through your own effort, then you can feel puffed up about it. But when I came to Christ, it was in a very, very difficult time. And I told God, I said, listen, I said, and at this point, I still didn't feel comfortable with the Trinity. Um, and I said, listen, God, it's not working. I know you're there. I, I've seen you working in my life, but um, I'm broken. And I said, I feel like I'm worshiping a man with this Jesus thing, but I'm going. And I said, like, even before that, I was like, God, look, 
if the Trinity is true, if Jesus and this gospel thing is true, please let me know, please. Like, I'm not trying to rebel, but I'm like, I don't believe it in my heart. So do you want me to just say like, yes, I believe in Jesus. And I don't like, you know, my heart. And it was really frustrating. But when I finally took the leap and they all, they often say like, uh, all you need is to have faith as small as a mustard seed to start with. And that, I guess, is what I had. I had just a mustard seed of faith in this uh, whole uh, New Testament Jesus stuff, Trinity. And I, right in this room here, and I went to my knees and I, I said, God, you know, I can be a better father. I can be a better husband. Um, I'm deeply flawed. I know I'm sinful. Even by my standards, my conscience is, it, my conscience is killing me. And I said, uh, I'm, you know, if, if this is the way you want me to do it, then I'm willing to try. And I, you know, said the sinner's prayer, like just basically admitted that I was a sinner, admitted that I was drowning my sin, admitted that I tried and tried to, to reach, reach, reach heaven, you know, by, by myself and, and to become enlightened. And it just wasn't working. I was empty inside. I was sad inside and I was broken. And I said, if I have to go through your son, then I will. And I prayed and I said, in Christ Jesus name. And my life changed. And the Holy Spirit came. And it wasn't anything dramatic. There wasn't a dove, you know, <laughs> flying down or tongues of fire. But all of a sudden, I started to understand uh, the Bible. It started opening it up to me, and I started to believe it to the point now that um, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are as real to me as the wood that I, I'm touching right now. Um, and and it's funny because there's passages say that the, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, testifies to your spirit that the Son, that Christ is is the Son of God, and it is it is so true. Like I can't unbelieve it now, and that's why people that criticize like, oh, you believe in Christianity, and and I'm like, no, I've experienced Christianity. It, it's real, and I can't deny it. You know, and, and most of the other religious paths that I was taking was kind of like, oh, I, that, that's a logical philosophy and, you know, reincarnation. Yeah, I can see that. And the soul must be eternal. You know, we make our mistakes here, but keep on. I mean, you know, it was, it was just like what I believed in was what uh, my mind thought was logical, but my mind and the mind of God is, is very different. And when the Holy Spirit comes, it it shows you the truth. It lets you know who the Son is. And if you keep on asking questions, it's not like I knew everything right away, but I kept on praying about the Trinity. I kept on reading. I kept on struggling with it. And uh, then I, I fell on Dr. Michael Heiser, uh, the Jewish Trinity. And and uh, uh, there's, there's some stuff about Jesus in the Old Testament. And, you know, it just started opening up opening up but you know christians that that just you know might do a prayer and they're christian and they actually do believe it they never read their bible uh, they don't surround themselves with other christians uh it's like they lose they lose strength you know uh they call it you know the daily bread so so the word of god the inspired word of god in the scriptures when you read it um it's like providing fuel for the holy spirit so you can have a tiny little sparky little candle of a spirit but if you feed the word the more you do the more that you're feeding the the holy spirit and then after the holy spirit becomes more and more uh, uh vibrant and strong it's like weight training it's like it's like your body you know it's like yeah I, I, I ate really good for like the last 20 years, but now I don't need to eat anymore. No, you'll last for some time. You'll get pretty weak, right? Galatians 3.26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So here's the question. Are we all children of God? Well, no. Um, 
we're only sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. This is what Christianity teaches. And yes, I understand. That's why I was kind of nervous and it's uncomfortable to talk about this because I have many friends, many people that I love. Uh, and, and I don't feel comfortable saying that because I remember how I felt Oh, how arrogant. Oh, really? Oh, you're the son. You're a child of God and I'm not like, who, who are you? You know? Uh, so, you know, it, it's a tough doctrine. It's a really tough doctrine. It's not something that, uh, that makes me feel uh, comfortable talking about it. I, I understand what it sounds like and looks like. 2 Corinthians 618. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So don't forget, when we're talking about sons of God, we're including we're including uh, uh, women, right? Um, you know, we're we're children of God, sons and daughters, right? So, um, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. John 1 12, but as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So you see here, um, it's not our right. Like he gives us the right to become. So we weren't, but we are becoming right. Children of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Ephesians 1.5 Having predestined us to be his own adopted children by Christ Jesus, according to the good pleasure of his will. So, you see, we're, we're adopted into God's family. Therefore, um, and we're adopted because we crucify the old man. We crucify our sinful desires and we put on Christ, right? We need to be clothed in the eternal son so that we can be in the presence of the father again. Okay. Um, we, we have, that's how, that's the, the phrases that you see in the new Testament, you know, uh, Christ lives in me, put on Christ, uh, you know, a crucified, the old man, uh, you know, all these things. It's all about, no, we are not born as children of God. We are, um, you know, human beings created by God, but we are not children of God, you know, nor could we ever be unless we had a savior because we can't fix ourselves ephesians uh and you were dead in the trespasses of sin in which you once walked following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience so you see these are human beings too we're not all children of god um many of us are sons of disobedience uh, were children of disobedience. Uh, I was. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh. I was, man. I was a party animal. You know, uh, it was like, you know, let's drink as much as I can, party, um, you know, yeah. And for a long time, I was a pretty nice guy, but it got to me. Eventually, the hedonistic lifestyle will uh, will erode your soul and when you look back it'll be too late you'll be a shadow of who you once were and you'll probably look back and realize how many how much horrible things you did um by being you know following the passions of the flesh because the passions of the flesh they're never satisfied any of the vices that we indulge in it's fleeting and then you need a higher and higher intensity to get the, the reward. And the more and more you do that, the more and more you're perishing, the more and more uh, you're eroding your, your soul and, and the con your conscience. You know, you'll erode your conscience too. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carry out the desires of the body and the mind, 
and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with, uh, with which he loved us, even when he Uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. So God's rich in mercy, and he has great love for your, everybody here on earth. He wants all of us to willingly come and love him. He's not going to force himself on you. Okay, he could have made robots that were perfect. You know, uh, he could have made beings that had no free will and just glorified him. No, he, he wants, because we're made in his image, he wants a being with free will that has a choice to love him or not, right? Or else it'd be fake, you know what I mean? And that's the problem with free will here. Don't, don't blame God for people who use their free will and willingly are perishing in sin following their passions and and they'll they'll do horrible things to themselves and to other people that's not god's fault okay god loves us and he, he gave us free will so um and god is working out salvation and you can see that in uh, revelation almost done uh, michelle Ephesians 2, 1 and 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, followed the course of the world, followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Here's an example. I was trying out... Uh, stream yard it's a it's a, a way of going on youtube and being able to live stream and get other people on so i was like testing it out on my phone towards the end of work i had no idea what i was doing so i put it up and then i finally you know um get like some guests that wanted to join you know and i'm like i'm just test test run you know it's just a test run and uh so i choose the first person And uh, I'm not even sure what I'm doing. And what happens? A bunch of porn pics uh, pop up. Now, this is on my live stream. I'm using StreamYards. I have no clue uh, how to stop this. I, I don't even know what I'm doing. And I got like, you know, uh, these disgusting images. Uh, if anybody was watching the live stream, boom, they're seeing it. Uh, then I, I let another guy in. Um, And uh, the guy started out, you know, seemed okay. And then before you know it, he was talking about, uh, you know, killing niggers and Jews and, and uh, asking me uh, what kind of women I like. And it's like, that's the world we live in. You know, it's like people are out there. These are the sons of disobedience. These are the uh, human beings that are following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan at the moment. Uh, and, you know, they live in the passions of their flesh and uh, they just, you know, they're perishing. And um, what do you, do you want? Do you want these kind of people to not accept Jesus, to not accept God's free gift? And when they die, they just enter the kingdom of heaven exactly like they are now whipping out like you know porn and, and wishing all jews and, and uh what he said niggers to die so do you do you want is that a uh, is that a child of god i don't i don't think so so if you see it that way um Ephesians 5, 6, let no one deceive you with empty words for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of dis disobedience. Judgment is coming. There will be a time just like uh, Noah's Ark. You know, there is a time uh, where the Ark, the door is open and the, the floods, the flood is coming and the, and the Ark door is still open. And you got Noah, you know, 
trying to tell people to change their way their ways and warning about the the coming uh, disaster everyone laughed and mocked at him and then the door shut and the flood came and this is what's going to happen people will be mocking like they did in the times of noah and uh right now christ is the ark and the doors open and they don't think the flood's coming. And they think that they'll keep on going on their merry way. And one day the flood will come. And uh, the wrath of God, the deserving wrath of God will be on these people. Romans 9, 8. That is, they who are the children of the flesh. These are not the children of God. Rather, the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Romans 9.22 What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? So in Galatians 4, 5, and 6, To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption. Okay, so we are uh, are adopted into God's family because ye are sons. God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Romans 8, 14 and 17. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God for Ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. There, that passage right there. I can really relate to that. That's what I'm telling you. Like, I was reading the Bible. uh, I was trying to figure this out. I was like, you know, I actually knew a lot pretty much the bible quite well when i wasn't even considered a christian but the spirit the holy spirit was not bearing witness to my spirit the truth about who christ was and that the truth of the gospel it's it was like maybe i don't know is it i had no clue i had to take that that tiny faith that i had and i gave it a try and the spirit, the Holy Spirit now beareth witness with my spirit. Uh, 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so, it be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. You might be hearing my, uh, my kid in the back coughing up a storm. I like this passage. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So only Jesus, okay, I like this one. Only Jesus could build a bridge to heaven with just two pieces of wood. So if you're not Christian, uh, I invite you to, um, you know, if you don't know how to pray, uh, you don't really have to say, uh, you know, an official prayer to um accept christ um but it maybe if you're somebody just doesn't have the words to say it you could at this point right now repeat after me or press pause and you can read this prayer or you can just pour your your heart out in your own words to god uh admit your faults and uh be you know just have enough faith to be open-minded to give it a try and see what happens so we'll finish with uh, the sinner's prayer lord i ad- sorry lord i admit i am a sinner i need and want your forgiveness i accept your death as the penalty for my sins and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love not based on anything i have done cleanse me and make me your child By faith, I receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. uh, From now on, 
help me to live for you with you in control in your precious name, Christ Jesus. Amen. All right. Have a good night. Love you guys.